Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again today. I'm Heather Ricciuto, and I'm happy to moderate this panel this afternoon, powered by IBM. I'm back this afternoon to talk about non-technical careers in cybersecurity, if there really is such a thing. Before we get into it, though, I'd like to introduce my panelists. Today, I have Christine, Farah, Karen, and Lindsay. And I'd like to start by asking each of them to briefly introduce themselves and tell us what their roles in cybersecurity are. And don't forget to include a fun fact. Let me start with you, Christine. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Connery. I work as a senior security consultant with IBM in the strategy, risk, and compliance. It's usually a long one, but I got it. <laughs> so as a part of my role, um, I work with teams, helping them go through uh, security assessments and threat risk um, uh, assessments as well. A fun fact about me is um, I love the winter. <laughs> Don't be proud of me, but it's, I just love winters. <laughs> Somebody has to. Yep. <laughs> Farah, how about you? Uh, I'm Farah Muhammad. I'm a security project manager. And uh, I, fun fact about me, I also like winter, uh, Christine. So that makes two of us here. Uh, and I also practice a little bit of Tai Chi and Kung Fu. So I'm dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Freeman. I work for IBM in the Security Intelligence Division. Um, I am a release manager and project manager. And a fun fact about me is that I have been playing a snare drum in a pipe band for more decades than you can probably imagine. Interesting. And Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Lindsay Evans here. I'm a business operations manager and uh, specialize in communications and change management within IBM Security, and I'm very happy to be a colleague of Karen. Um, a fun fact about me, I actually am a metalsmith and love to play around making jewelry. Oh, interesting. See, we have a lot of creative people in, in cybersecurity, don't we? And, you know, to be fair, I really should have thought of a fun fact about myself, but... I'm going to have to give that some thought and maybe I'll share something at the end. <laughs> so um, let's get into the topic of non-technical careers in cybersecurity. You know, I did a quick little search this morning on the internet and learned that roughly a third of roles in cybersecurity are classified as non-technical. And in fact, they, they include project managers. Um, you know, two of you are, are project managers. I too what, worked as a project manager for many, many years and project manager is classified as non-technical. But I, you know, before we really get into whether or not roles are truly non-technical or not, I want to actually start by asking each of you about your educational backgrounds so that we can give our audience a bit of an idea of the diverse educational backgrounds you all come from. And how you apply your education to your roles in cybersecurity. I'm going to go in reverse order this time. Lindsay. I'd have to say uh, my education formally was really a uh, bachelor's of education. I worked with children and youth uh, and then transitioned into adult training and development uh, surrounding specifics for special education and neurodiversity needs. 
uh, this was quite a few years ago, uh, the skills that really from there and from my teaching experience uh, and coaching experience are really the people skills and being able to identify gaps in process, needs for people. And if I can't solve it myself, understanding who those go-to people are to collaborate, to get it done, I'd say at the bare minimum, those transferable skills from working in education and little ones for so long have really helped drive my support for adults in the cybersecurity industry. Thanks, Lindsay. Karen. My background, uh, so I've got a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology. And so uh, that I felt has related to a lot of work that I've done over the years, just because it is study of human behavior and, and how societies work. Um, so I felt I've always kind of brought that over into any role I've done. Then I did a master's um, in business administration. Uh, and the biggest thing that that program taught me that I carried over to, um, you know, working within cybersecurity and, and security intelligence is um, the ability to have to learn a lot of information really quickly. And, you know, teams um, are, are doing the same thing all the time. They're constantly learning. Um, so anyway, that, that, that was one of the biggest things that I felt that my background really carried over to, to my position in IBM. Very good. Thank you, Karen. Farah. Um, I studied uh, English literature uh, overseas, and then I graduated with a bachelor degree in IT uh, here in uh, York University in Canada. But I always felt that the need to introduce myself as a non-technical person, even though I had a bachelor's degree in IT, I really don't remember anything that I studied. Even when I graduated, I felt like I had zero knowledge about uh, IT. Uh, later on, I got my uh, project management certificate from the PMI organization. And being a project manager, it really is about knowing how to follow methodologies in implementing projects without having industry knowledge about any of the projects that you're delivering, but definitely having the knowledge about the vocabularies and understanding of what's going around you. And Christine. So I have my bachelor's in engineering, electronics and communications. Um, and again, I have no idea what I learned for the past four for those four years, but it was a lot of a lot of electronics related things, which kind of helped me. But again, I knew I did not want to pursue electronics as a career, so I did uh, my master's in information systems um, in the University of Melbourne and in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that's where I knew that I loved consulting um, and that's a career I want to pursue in. And that particular degree, though it was not exactly in cybersecurity, it helped me understand management and technology and how they go hand in hand. And I think in cybersecurity now, it's important to understand both and know the merging between both of them. Uh, and then when I... Um, came to Canada uh, two and a half years back, I uh, did a bridging program in Seneca on cybersecurity where I actually understood what the core skills in cybersecurity are. So you heard it folks, lots of different backgrounds and it's kind of interesting. It, you know, Lindsay and Karen, you came from non-technical educational backgrounds originally, now working in cybersecurity. Farah and Christine started out in, you know, technical studies and, and have kind of moved into roles that they consider to be non-technical. And so that kind of leads me nicely to my next question, which is, are there really non-technical roles in cybersecurity? I know what my belief is, but I'd like to hear from, from each of you. Karen, I see you nodding your head. Do you have something, uh, you know, do you have a response to that question? Yeah, I just feel like I'm a great example, um, just because um, uh, absolutely, you know, um, the, the program manager role, the the project manager role, I think you need to get, uh, and I think Farah just, just talked about that briefly as well, you know, you got to get really comfortable with um, 
having people speak an entirely different language around you um, and just being able to pick out the pieces that you need to know to do your position well and to support the team and, and all the stakeholders that are that are all working towards a successful project or a successful release. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, you can find uh, the role that fits your background and um, help help that team uh, be successful. Farah, how about you? What are what are your thoughts on whether, you know, I've kind of heard how you describe your role as non technical, although it is kind of technical. So, um, you know, what do what do you have to say on the on the topic? Definitely. I consider myself an example of uh, a person in security who's not technical. As I mentioned, although my degree was uh, in IT, I really did not feel like I have the ability to present myself as a technical person. And being a project manager, um, there, I work with a lot of smart people who, by surrounding myself with, I look smart as well. Um, I learn from them. I see how they use certain terminologies and how they communicate with the client. And that is how I get my information and put it in a way that my client and I, we speak English and the technical team speak different language, as Karen said. So I get that information translated into English and give it to my client and we're, we're all happy. So it's really about understanding how to communicate with the technical team and being being clear about that the things that you don't understand and you need help with and I really consider myself as an example of a technical person in uh, cybersecurity. And, and when you when let me clarify something like when you say the developers speak another language I'm interpreting what you mean to say they speak technical lingo that not everybody understands right yeah. and as a as the project manager you need to be able to translate that lingo into or jargon into words that the folks on the business side will understand. The folks who really come to, come to the table with the business requirements, right? Definitely, okay. that's, that's correct. And not only the lingo, but also the acronyms. And mm -hmm. we all say that IBM loves acronyms. So we have this and that and try to put it into a way that everyone understand it. And that's very summarized and very into the point. Yeah, yeah. I know when I worked as a project manager, I, I led lots of transformation projects, internal transformation projects within IBM, and I often describe myself as a translator, right? That the middle, the middle person between, just as you described, between the business and the development team. Definitely. So, you know, I asked you all if there really are non-technical roles in cybersecurity. And I said, I have my opinion and I'll just share briefly with you what I think. I, my belief is there are varying degrees of, of being technical. And, you know, I think that when you work in the tech industry, as we all do at IBM, you, you know, we are all technical to some degree. And when I, when I hear people say that they are, they're not technical, I remind them that they, they are, you know, if you're, if you're working for IBM, you're technical in some way, shape or, or form, whether it, cause to be technical doesn't mean necessarily that you're coding, right. That you're a developer and you're writing, you know, um, writing code. So any other thoughts to add on, on that topic, Christine or Lindsay? Yeah, I could share a quick thought here. So I think when you say technical, the definition of, of technical is different for each person. So that's something that, you know, when I started my career, I knew I was more, I wanted to be technology and business, but I wanted to be more focused on the business side because that's the area of my strength. Um, so having that conversation with my manager, with and again, I'm not talking for every company, but IBM in particular is focused on on individuals growth. So when I have the conversation with my manager, I say, hey, there are technical roles like architects in my team and there are consulting roles and I wanna be more in the consulting role. So I, I, I do that, I do not code. I learned how to code in engineering, but I promise you, I've not read a line of code in my career in cybersecurity and I'm still able to deliver value to my clients just as much because in IBM, it's if I, as far as said, like we all work as a team. So there's some things that I work in my strength and there's some things that 
others work in their strengths. So I think it's about everyone can be successful. There's always growth. And I feel like if you're curious, that's the, um, the qualifier for a role in cybersecurity. Thanks, Christine. And, you know, you touched on something that I think is really important besides the curiosity, and that is you were able to identify your own strengths and figure out where, where you would best fit and where you really wanted to, to play a role and, and, and hone, your, hone your own skills, right? Farah, as a, as a project manager, you mentioned you work with a lot of smart people. So tell us, a little, maybe if you can, a little bit about the type of projects that you work on and the roles that those smart people play that, that you okay. mentioned. We work on different kinds of projects, whether it is new implementations where we go to a greenfield, customer wants us to build their security environment, or we do some projects where we take over the existing environment and we manage it on their behalf. Um, both projects are very interesting and kind of unique in nature and they take long time to be delivered. Um, one of the examples I have to mention is um, taking over an existing environment. And that's, I, I, in my opinion, that's more difficult than building an environment in a green field because when you're playing with a green field, you know how you're gonna place your things and how you can, can connect them together. But taking over an existing environment, it means that you need to understand what's in place today, how it's gonna be interacting with what you're implementing or introducing, and how is that gonna impact the customer overall. So we're currently working on a project where we're taking over existing environment and I'm working with a lot of architects on this project and a lot of SMEs from different domains in IBM, whether it is from um, vulnerability scanning, hackers, uh, hardware deployment, and so on and so forth. The engineers or the architects I'm working with ask questions about how we're gonna be building VPN tunnels that are going to connect between our support team and the client existing environment. And when they start these discussions, I just blank out, like, what is VPN? What is end-to-end uh, -end tunnel? What is IPsec? What are you asking for? And I see them, they understand each other and they're collecting information and they're like, oh, oh no, 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 this is not gonna work this way. Maybe we need to consider it a GSNI connection. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, if that works, sure, let's consider that. So this is one of the example I can bring into, I can think of right now. And it's really interesting to see that the other people understand each other and and they, they feel the pain and they're like, oh, yeah, I, I see what you're talking about here. And you might be right. Let's consider another option. I was like, yeah, do that. Now, but what do you do to gain the, no the level of knowledge that you need in order to be able to take that back to the, you know, folks like yourself, folks on the business side? Who, who need to have some level of understanding. Maybe they're the ones who, you know, maybe some of them have to do some testing for you, uh, for example. How do, you, how do you explain, you know, how do you translate the, the, that alternate language <laughs> that you were Definitely. talking about earlier? So it's a, it's a learning progress. So the first project that I worked on, I didn't have a clue about this information they were talking about. The second project, I start building the knowledge and understanding what these items they're talking about and how they interact together. And now I'm capable of, capable of going to the customer in, in, in simple terms and tell them that the thing that we need to deliver this outcome needs to be available by a certain time or needs to be tested in a certain way. Because now I understand what is the purpose of that tunnel, for example, or what's the purpose of uh, this connectivity to be done in a certain way. And I can also tell the customer, um, inquiring from the customer about change requests that they have in place, processes that we need to follow and take that information and go back to my team. So it's a, it's a learning in progress, learning from each project and trying to replicate that learning and making sure that your understanding is correct. You go back to the SMEs, you validate your understanding, you validate the, the information that you're gonna be gathering for, for those SMEs from the client and uh, you go from there. 
Thanks, Farah. Now, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit for a moment and come back to Lindsay and and ask you, Lindsay, what does it mean to be a business operations manager? Can you help our audience uh, understand? As, <laughs> as simple three words may sound, <laughs> it's quite broad. Um, there's 10, I mean, not to sound too clinical about it, but there's 10 specific areas, really, cross-functional management operations, data collection, growth, strategic planning, change management, communications, finance, people, and project management. So it's, that's a lot, right? So it's really strategically fitting yourself into where the business needs are and identifying, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, gaps in process, how to make things smoother, ensure everyone is on the same page while at the same time ensuring that the day-to-day -day operations of labs and offices are going strong. So um, I play liaison with everything from real estate to facilities and contractors and landlords and all of that wonderful stuff. And I also sit in on executive calls and help facilitate and organize large mass internal marketing items. And then I could also be in the same day sitting in on a call working with business resource groups and advising on diversity and inclusion items. So it's it's very far reaching. It's very hard, Heather, I'm sorry, to put it all into one quick little thing. I think at the end of the day though, um, the biggest portion of uh, business operations itself is just making sure that every player in the game has what they need or knows how to get it, or you can help facilitate it for them. And that may sound simple, but when you've got hundreds of people, <laughs> it can get a little, like get a little technical. I'll use that term. Right, right. And, and Christine, tell us a little more about what you do as a consultant. Mm -hmm. So as a strategy risk and compliance consultant, uh, what we do is we work a lot with our clients to ensure that um, the standards that they are following are up to the standards of the industry standards, like for example, NIST, ISOs, uh, FFIEC, depending on what standards they have to follow with industry regulations. So we go through the process with them, understand what is currently in place, um, understanding their maturity level right now to the industry maturity, and then mapping to see what are some of the gaps that are in their security program till date. So we have a lot of tools within IBM itself and a lot of industry specific tools. Uh, so this is again, one part of my job. So I'm gonna talk first about the, the compliance part of it. So once we go through this, we, we do a gap analysis and then we could be like, okay, so these are the places where you have to improve on. Uh, and then we build a strategy roadmap for our clients. We build programs around which help our clients to achieve the goals they have to achieve or just to be compliant and to help them with their audits. The second part of what I do is threat risk assessments or vulnerability assessments, where we look at the different programs within the organization and look at what are some of the places in which uh, there is a risk factor here, which could be addressed and how uh, we could address it in order to protect the organization so that there's, uh, there are no complications um, coming forward. So among a lot of things, these are some of the two main projects that I work on. Thanks, Christine. And really to, to all of you, I guess, do you, do you work with others who are in roles that, that would be considered non-technical, like technical writers or um, lawyers? Do you have, you know, ever get involved with our lawyers or um, policy makers, for example, just to, to name a few? Yeah, Heather, I'd say in for business operations specifically on my front, a, a large component of that is the relationships, right? And those those folks exactly as you're describing that you're you're collaborating with. If it's uh, at present consolidating communications resources, that type of thing, and ensuring it goes out, you've got a lot of key stakeholders in the technical field as well as the non-technical field, um, or or those role terms, uh, operations as a whole there's about 15 different items underneath there that are very specialized. And, and so you're working with mass groups of people who may not be the architects and the coders and the hackers, but are making everything work in the background. And, and what do you think about, um, you know, the di diversity of, of teams 
And when I'm in this case, talking about diversity, I'm thinking about all the different roles, the different experiences that people bring to the table, including their educational backgrounds. How does, how does that play into the outcomes of our project teams, our innovations, et cetera? Um, well, we don't have, uh, for myself, I don't have visibility on the um, educational background for the team, but I do see the diversity in terms of, um, we have female engineers, we have people from overseas, uh, we have people from different backgrounds and nationalities and religions that are working in the team. And in my team in specific, I believe we have a higher number of women as product managers than men. And we, there are, we, we outnumber the men in the team, yes. Uh, so from a diversity perspective, I can see that there is um, an equal opportunity here at IBM to hire people based on their experience and their qualifications and what they can bring to the team. Uh, I had the opportunity to interview a couple of people uh, as, uh, and, and the thing that we focus on beside the, the um, qualifications and the, uh, um, the thing we focus on beside the qualification is the, the team spirit. If that person can fit into the team mentality and be part of it, or are they gonna be difficult to deal with or not? So uh, that's the things we focus on and that's definitely helped us diversify our team into having people from all over the place. Thanks, Farah. Anyone else have anything to add? I can speak, oh, sorry, Karen. Oh, go ahead, Christine. <laughs> okay, so I, I can speak to a bit about this skill set diversity that we have. Like I totally agree with Farah. It's amazing how we have such a diverse group, but with regards to the skill sets, um, again, one good thing about IBM is you have everybody within the company. Like whenever you have any questions, like you can always reach out um, to different people. For example, if in a project you have a question on cloud, though this team is not a part of uh, my immediate team, there's always someone I can reach out to internally. Uh, but within the within the working project teams ourselves, we're always so diverse uh, in our skill sets. We have different years of experience coming in and different um, experiences of different projects. Um, so I think since we work with multiple different clients, in a day, I usually am working on three or four different clients. So we have different experiences that are brought to the table, uh, which really help bring the different perspectives. So everyone's not coming in with the same ideas. We have different ideas brought to the table, which help deliver greater value to our clients. Thanks, Christine. So I, I want to remind our audience, by the way, that if you have questions, feel free to put them in the, in the chat. And, and we'll tr do our best to answer your questions. We do have one, which I believe we've already touched on, but I'll ask it again. How, how do you develop the knowledge and skills that you need in order to, to do the translation we were, we were talking about earlier? Um, and Karen and Farah, I think, you know, that mainly came from, from both of you. I, you know, what I heard if I could kind of paraphrase what, what you said, Farah, it's from listening and absorbing everything, everything that you hear the development team talking about. And likewise, you, you know, the cus the customer is, that's, is that fair? That's fair. And I would like to add one thing as well. Um, Self-learning. Um, IBM is one of the company that invest in providing materials all over the place for different technologies, different purposes. Uh, for interpersonal skills technology. So going utilizing this kind of materials and then there are different materials online that are uh, accredited or that are made available for the people to develop their skills. There's always new technologies every time and new terminologies every time. So self-learning is definitely an asset that need to be utilized. And Karen, are, are there any resources that you would actually recommend to our listeners? You know, there are so many free resources out there. Um, Farah mentioned the fact that IBM invests in a lot of resources for our employees, but what about our audience? 
many, most of whom are not IBMers, what, you know, what, what resources could they take advantage of? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, it, it's really, um, I find personally, it's staying on top of um, uh, industry trends, industry news. Um, if you can uh, plug yourself in to, uh, you know, just always be reading what's happening. Um, if you're not understanding what people are, are saying in a meeting, I'm, I'm constantly um, doing that extra bit of research on the side. You know, for, for a role that's non-technical, you don't need to know the depth of of, of a topic, but you need to know, you know, the breadth of, of what's happening. So, um, it, and really, uh, you know, I would suggest uh, instead of, you know, s- saying something specific is um, what interests you and what then re- is related to the role that you're in, or maybe the um, uh, division or organization that you're working in, what, what their industry focus is. Um, and then you get excited about it and you want to read more. Um, that would be my suggestion. No, that's a great suggestion because there, there, there are so many online journals and news feeds in the cybersecurity space to, to take advantage of. Do, do any of you have any favorites? Um, I like to utilize Bright Talk. They have a lot of webinars and uh, sometimes I find good webinars on LinkedIn as well, but Bright Talk has a lot of good webinars, especially on uh, privileged ID management and cybersecurity. So that's one of the items uh, I go to, or one of the sources I go to. Terrific. Christine. I, re- I refer securityintelligence.com. That's an IBM specific. And it's usually, um, again, I like the, t- the content and also the way it's presented. Um, I. Personally, I guess I gain a lot from people's experiences and the thought process. So uh, attending seminars like these um, and other networking events really helped me gain my knowledge. That, that's a great point. Um, let's talk about that a little bit, a bit more. But before we do, I just want to clarify, Christine, you mentioned securityintelligence.com and described it as IBM specific. I just want to clarify, it is IBM specific in that it is our online cybersecurity journal. However, the content is not strictly IBM content. And um, we, in fact, have a lot of guest writers um, in addition to IBMers who write content for securityintelligence.com. So definitely a lot can be learned there. And there are, there are so many more to choose from. Um, quickly, Lindsay or Karen, you have any recommendations before I we actually, move? Actually, yeah, for sure. I am an out individual um, and uh, belong to the LGBT plus community. And I go to lesbians who tech a heck of a lot. And it's absolutely fantastic external to IBM, of course. Um, but the amount of resources in there that I've learned and be able from SIEM all the way through to where I am now six and a half years later was phenomenal in addition to the IBM internal, uh, uh, just autonomous learning that I've have been able to take part in. And can, sorry, can you say that name again for our audience? Yes. Lesbians? Lesbians Who Tech. Lesbians Who Tech. And that's an online resource? As yeah, a- absolutely. Okay. Yep. Now, do they have special interest groups, you know, because uh, I want to kind of segue into that, that there's, part of the conversation yeah, which there's, Christine mentioned. It, it's, it's just beyond any scope that I've actually seen, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of free resources as paid as well, but um, the information on there I find is very, uh, provides an overview for, for specific technical roles. What does this mean? Sort of hacking, all of that type of stuff. And then breaks out in between their specific projects, uh, addresses cybersecurity very, very well, um, mentions IBM and others as well within there. And uh, it's just really a, a well-rounded amount of education and information. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm just looking to see what other questions are are coming in. Here's a question. Do you feel that grads with philosophy, linguistics and sociology backgrounds will be more in demand? I, I, I'll, I'll take that one real, really quickly and say, I don't, I can't say that there'll be more in demand, but I can say that there, there, is a place for people with all of those skills in cybersecurity, um, you know, because I know that one of you mentioned er, uh, earlier in the conversation something about the human factor, right? Understanding how 
how people think, for, for example, it plays a very important role in, in cybersecurity. So I, I know plenty of people in this industry with, with those sorts of, the, of backgrounds, whether it's f philosophy, linguistics, or sociology. Um, another is criminology. Lot, you know, um, as well as the, there are a lot of folks with um, military backgrounds also that have transferred into, into cybersecurity roles. So I think honestly that the, um, you know, the opportunities are endless. And frankly, there's a, there's a place for, for everyone, no matter what your background is. Any, any thoughts from my panelists on that? No, I, I just, I completely agree. Uh, you know, I'm coming from a cultural anthropology uh, background and um, in that, you know, really relates to organizational behavior. Um, Lindsay talked about, you know, the, the um, importance of being able to communicate and, and seeing how other groups are connected to each other. Um, so yeah, very valuable. Thanks, Karen. All righty. So we talked a little bit about recommendations on, on learning resources. Any other advice for listeners out there who maybe aren't actually working in cybersecurity yet and they do not have technical backgrounds and perhaps they've been told, um, you know, they don't have what it takes because they don't have a computer science degree, for example. You know, that's one of the, the myths out there that that you have to have a computer science or an engineering degree to work in cybersecurity, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. Many people in this business do, of course, have those types of degrees, but not everyone does. Um, so, any any thoughts on other, you know, any other advice for for folks um, just starting me, out? Yeah, let me let me just touch base on something that. Uh that my colleague here mentioned earlier is that the transferable skills. Uh, transferable skills is something that you really need to have to be able to put yourself out there. And one of the things that really help is networking. So if you build your network and you start communicating with people, uh, building your network through LinkedIn or through such webinars or such events uh, will help you to get um, in touch with um recruiters or people who might know an opportunity and judging from knowing you and knowing your transferable skills, they will see if you're a good fit to that team or that opportunity. A lot of companies hire skill, hire personality and train skills. So maybe that would be you for the future opportunity. Yeah, I'd have to echo that actually. And, and just expanding on those transferable skills, if having an, the right attitude and embracing the culture. I think we're very lucky within IBM in regard to our uh, internal culture um, and having the autonomy to grow and uh, direct your path as you wish to in regard to career development. Um, but those being a go-getter, really having that right attitude, if you are apt to learn, as Karen mentioned, and you are apt to identify maybe a break in a process and you know exactly how to fix it and can provide the tools or suggestions or a plan on how to do it, that's a sink in. And for folks wondering um, just about careers in general that are non-technical, I get asked a lot, are there actually that many around? And I think if we listed them all out, we'd be here for an hour um, just within IBM Canada alone. So um, having just that right aptitude and really embracing um, everything that goes along with people, not necessarily people management, it's the possibilities are endless with the non-technical. Yep, Karen, I see you nodding your head. Any Anything to add? Just, just echoing, you know, this, the same thing. Um, it's really about uh, being in a role that you know you're, you are supporting that whole team um, to reach a, a successful release or a successful project. And um, a lot of technical people you work with, they definitely don't want to do the work that we're doing. So, um, you know, it, it, it does give you a lot of sense of pride because you are 100% part of um, a bigger a bigger thing um, that that's being worked on. So even though um, yes, you may not be an architect or um, um, you know pr producing code, you are helping to uh, bring something out um, to, um, to people. 
And sometimes one of the toughest jobs is actually keeping others on track, right? Keeping them on schedule, keeping containing the scope of a project. And, you know, if you can bring those kinds of, of skills to the, to the table, that's terrific because there's, you know, those kinds of skills are sorely needed, you know, throughout the um, early part of the conversation, I know I, I wrote down a few words that I heard um, coming from, from each of you when you talked about some of the, some of the skills and they were words like curiosity and collaboration and um problem solving, passion for learning. And, you know, these are themes that those are constant themes throughout any, any conference uh, that I, that I attend any discussions on the topic of skills, those, those always come up because those are the foundational transferable skills that no matter whether you're in a technical or a non-technical role, they're very, very important, right? Um, we all have to be able to to work with others and so that's where collaboration comes in um you you talked a couple of you talked about the you know showing demonstrating a passion for for learning and demonstrating self-motivation those two are key you don't know how many times i've heard hiring managers both inside and outside of ibm in the cybersecurity space say they hire for passion um so and when and what they mean by that of course is a, a is all the things that we talked about, the passion for learning, passion for cybersecurity itself, and um, you know, just contributing to the ethical side of, 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 of the equation. Let's see if we have any other uh, questions from our audience. Do you see any, any of the arts in cybersecurity, especially digital arts and um, UX design? I see nodding. Hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yes, um, UX design play in cybersecurity. It, it's essential. Um, it's literally the ins and outs of how everything works, from brand, product, and out of the door. So, yeah, absolutely. There's so many nuances within there. You have your feet wet in that industry, for sure. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Yep, we have, you know, IBM, IBM security is, uh, it's a big team. And we have, you know, we have people covering all the roles that we've talked about today, including folks who um, are UX designers. And um, we've also got, you know, if you're, if you're in marketing, you've got marketing skills, there could be a place for you in the cybersecurity in industry as well, right? I shouldn't call it an industry. It's not really an industry. That that always <laughs> kind of gets me. The cybersecurity profession. <laughs> I find too, Heather, there's a, a maybe a misconceived notion or something of the like that um, within cybersecurity, right? The reason we're all chatting here, that technical role focus and that eventually, or at some point, non-technical roles might phase down a little bit and then there's ebbs and flows. Um, in my experience, just in the six and a half years I've been here, uh, as cybersecurity grows, the need for people to manage everything else that goes along with that grows. And I have seen um, operations itself triple since 2014. So um, there's never, like, I just encourage folks, even if you think you have a little iota of experience that would count to something, just apply, see where it takes you, take a few classes. It's, it's really fantastic to see the amount of growth that's been internal as well as external within the profession. You know, um, so we actually had a question in, from our audience, which was, do you think that more uh, non-technical roles in cybersecurity will emerge? And, you know, I, I, you know, I wish if we had a crystal ball that, you know, we'd all be rich. Um, but, you know, based on what, what you said, Lindsay, I think, I think at the very least, the need for non-technical roles will remain consistent, uh, you know, as a percentage of the overall profession. And the need for non-technical skills is never, never going to, to go away. Um, and, and what I can tell the audience is that cybersecurity is, is the only profession that I know where we have zero unemployment. In fact, I've heard, I've heard it referred to as negative unemployment. You know, there are, uh, approximately 3 million open and unfilled jobs around the world 
right now. So if you're looking for work and you're, you have any inclination to, to come join us in cybersecurity, we encourage you to do so. Please, please come and join us. Okay, we have another question. Um, and I, 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 I'm not sure if I know what this question is getting at, but I'll pose it and see if anybody has a response. Could you comment on how seniorpreneur communities could get involved in cyber? Do you, so what, do you, I, uh, what I understand is seniorpreneurs are uh, older generation <laughs> who are getting their feet wet in regard to their own business or going back to work different fields. Um, if I get that uh, explanation wrong, please feel free to message me on LinkedIn. Um, but uh, I would say there's no barrier at all. I haven't found a barrier in regard to age or anything of the like, to be honest, within IBM. There's also specific programs for hiring, recruitment, retention, everything of the like to folks who have experience and life experience is one of those. You may have a few more added years on than some of us on this call and have a breadth of experience in regard to people and uh, those transferable skills as we were all speaking about. And there's, there's no shying away from that, absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with you. There, it's never too late to, to join the cybersecurity workforce. And there's a, I often t uh, refer to a, a story of, of my own, um, which is this. A couple of years ago, I met a woman at a conference and she had been a teacher for 30 years. And here she was at a cybersecurity conference. And I said, what, what brings you to a cybersecurity conference? And she said, I've gone back to school, I'm studying cybersecurity, and this is going to be my second career. The women in my family live into their 90s, and so I figure I'm going to live another, uh, you know, a very long life, and I'm going to need, you know, I'm going to need this second career. So, so there you go. If she can do it, so can you. Oh, that's, I really love that story, Heather. I'm going to use that sometime. <laughs> But I yeah, I've never, for, I've just, you know, I've never forgotten her. I thought it was so inspiring. Absolutely. And also I think with that, it comes with, it's like cybersecurity is not just a career, but I think people who are, who are successful in cybersecurity are those who are actually passionate about it. And something that helped me get my foot in the door was actually to talk to like, you know, to understand my transferable skills and that I did by having informational interviews. This was a new concept to me, but actually asking people what they do in the industry and then be like, oh yeah, I, I, I like that, I can do that. And then talk to that was, I guess, you know, something like the teacher you met that I can do it, like they're doing it, I can do it, but I need to know what I can do and what's on the table for grabs. So. Yeah, informational interviews is something for even for people who are looking for senior printers, find people who in the industry who have gone that route, there's always place for everybody. That's great advice, Christine. And do you think that it's possible to come into this profession with a non-technical background, but then evolve into a technical role? Christine, go ahead. Okay, for me, I was just for me personally, absolutely. That's what happened to me. I came in with some experience of security, uh, but I evolved in the role. I learned on the job. And that was, again, I wouldn't have been able to learn by myself. So I looked up resources. I asked questions. I still ask a lot of questions. And one of the reasons, personally, I had other offers of why I chose IBM was when I looked at the people there, everyone was 10, 15 years in IBM with so much experience. I'm like, wow, this is a treasure bank of wisdom that I can gain from. So I learn every day. So it's, it's always constantly gaining that information. I still am. So I learn every day. There's something new I learn. So, yeah. Thank you. Is there, is there anything, you know, that I haven't touched on any questions I haven't uh, posed, you know, that you, that you all would like to talk about? I think you covered a big range of different questions and especially on whether being technical or not can help into the roles. 
Um, I just want to second uh, on Christine's point about not being technical and evolving into a technical person. Uh, I've met someone in IBM who was who had a PhD degree in chemical engineering, and he was looking for a job for quite some time, and he couldn't find a job. So he took a certificate in security, cybersecurity, and that was a couple of months certificate. And he's today considered one of the best assets that IBM has. And the way I hear people talking about him and his, about his uh, method of communicating to the client, it's, uh, it makes him a, a, one of the best technical people in the team, although he doesn't have the same technical background as the team. And uh, recently his son also joined us and his son comes with a, a diploma in cybersecurity. So they're competing now. But uh, the thing is that person might have a, um, he had a, a, an advantage with that certificate, but even though if he hadn't have it, he would have still been uh, considered an asset if he was given the right opportunity. Um, and he evolved from a non-technical person to one of the most important technical people. You, you bring up a really great point. And that is, you know, because you mentioned having a, a degree in chemical engineering and then taking a certificate and then, um, and then you also mentioned, I think that his his son has some sort of a, a certificate as well in cybersecurity. And you know, that's a there's a really big trend in recent years, it, not just in IBM, but in the now in the industry as a as a whole. And that is that we look at people not just with degrees. You know, we we look at skills first, frankly. And so you don't necessarily have to have a university degree, or if you do have to, if you do have a univers a degree, it doesn't have to be, as I said earlier, in computer science or in engineering or cybersecurity specifically, because we can, you know, others can help you translate the skills that you learned with, um, you know, whatever degree or certificate that, that you do have. Um, and I know there, there is a real trend in people with degrees um, in what would seemingly be unrelated uh, fields going back and, and taking some kind of a certificate program, right? Just to kind of get, you know, or maybe going to a, um, a boot camp there, for example, there are, are plenty of them out there. They, they range in length. Some are eight weeks, some are 12 weeks, some are 16 weeks, but whatever the, the case is, um, it's a good way to kind of get a foundational understanding of what, what cybersecurity is all, is all about. Christine, you, you, um, you mentioned going to, to Seneca when you, um, you know, after coming to, to Canada, right? Tell us a little bit more of, about that. What did, what was the result of that program that you attended there? Was it a certificate? Sure, so it was a certification program. So it was okay. three months, uh, but it was, uh, it was not directly from Seneca. It was a certificate from Seneca, but with collaboration with Access Employment. So we had a few people, like I think two or three, prof three professors coming from Seneca to the Access Employment location, and they taught us different parts of uh, in cybersecurity. So it was a cohort of 20 people. So we got to learn from a higher level what are the different components of security, and we got to do some uh, hands-on work as well. And, and would you say that was a good complement to your prior education? Absolutely. So it helped me understand the technical aspects of cybersecurity and also gain from the knowledge of somebody in that industry. Because uh, to be honest, I thought cybersecurity was all about just the hackers. But then I was like, no, you have IAM, you have data security, you have strategy, you have operations, and you have the red team, the blue team, and all these wonderful different uh, uh, jargons within security. So in order to be successful in my interview and to know to show IBM or the interviewers that I am serious about cybersecurity and I know what I'm getting into, that program really prepared me for that. 
So your comment about having thought that cybersecurity was all about hacking, uh, that's what the title of our session actually was all about, right? Cybersecurity isn't just hacking. And, <laughs> you know, that that is one of the, the myths out there as well. And yes, we do have some really awesome hackers in this, in this business um, who you know, we, without them, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to help make the world a, a safer place. But, um, you know, we're not all that, you know, skilled in, in hacking. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there are lots of us who are, are not. Um, we have a question for you, Farah, which is what sort of courses did you take? Um, for me or for the individual I was talking about uh, earlier, it looks like the question, oh, no, no, sorry, the individual. Yep. Yeah, I misunderstood the question. Yeah, no, it's okay. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the course that he took, but I do know that a lot of uh, different colleges provide different kind of diploma certificates for cybersecurity, which can be utilized, but it skips my, my mind right now what name of uh, certificate he applied to. I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, we are almost out of time here. We have five minutes left. And, and so I'll go back to asking what advice you, you might give to our listeners who are considering pursuing a career in cybersecurity, or what about those who are, um, you know, more specifically, who do come from non-technical backgrounds and they'd like to make their way into, into cybersecurity. Any advice from I can, you, I can start off. Oh, sure, Karen. Sure, I mean, it's just the, you know, the repeating of um, always be learning. Um, you know, be in that mindset of, you know, you the, the people that you're working with are, are constantly learning because that's, that's part of what they do. Um, and uh, I think uh, doing the same in your role that's non-technical is really important. And uh, being a non, you know, in a non-technical role, working with, with people that are quite technical, um, be careful of the imposter syndrome. You know, uh, you are there for a reason and um, you play a part uh, to help the big machine and, and the wheel turn. Um, so, you know, just, uh, just remember that uh, your role is uh, significant and important. Thanks, Karen. I, I'll follow that. Karen. I just love that you brought up imposter syndrome. I was going to say that myself. I just think it's a key regardless of where you are and what profession, but especially when you've got that technical versus non-technical, the imposter syndrome is real. So keeping yourself in check is really important. Um, the only advice really I would give folks is communicate. Don't be afraid to network and make those relationships. And coaches or mentors are everything. If you think that you may have a niche in the industry, if you think that within the profession of cybersecurity, your skills, your go-getter attitude, your embracing culture can be a good fit within there, don't be afraid to make those connections, ask questions, and try to develop a relationship with somebody in the industry that can help maybe guide you or mentor you through the system. Great advice, Lindsay. Yesterday, we had a panel on mentoring on the agenda this, for the week. And so for those of you out there who didn't have a chance to attend that session, I, I do encourage you to listen to the replay when that becomes available at the end of, uh, at the, end of the week. And, yeah. you know, actually, I want to go back to special interest groups because we kind of touched on that earlier and then didn't really get into, into the meat of, of that and the, you know, the real value of joining special interest groups. So, you know, several of you have touched on the value of, of networking with, uh, you know, and building your network, especially when, if you're wanting to get to know people who work in the cybersecurity profession and perhaps figure out what they do and then where you might fit. Um, and one of the greatest ways to do that is indeed to join to join special interest groups. Do any of you have any favorites that you that you belong to and that you would recommend to our audience? I could take that. I have a favorite, <laughs> which is leading cyber ladies uh, in Toronto. And the reason I'm, I would say this is because I joined when I was 
when I was in the part of my career where I did not have a job and networking and learning more about the field, getting mentors in this particular uh, group helped me be more confident in those interviews. And I could, and some of the people who came in, like they were able to give me leads, they're able to talk to me about what their organization does. And that helped me to get going back. Um, and Women in Wisis is also a great resource that I'm constantly learning from. So uh, I think these are my top two based on personal experience. Thanks, Christine. I'm sure Helen Oakley, if you're out there, um, you appreciate the plug for leading cyber ladies. And of course, I thank you, Christine, for mentioning Wisis. Um, we have, there, there are WESIS uh, affiliates around the world, and there is one right here in Ontario. So I encourage everybody to, to check out Leading Cyber, Cyber Ladies and WESIS. Any others from Lindsay, Karen, or Farah before we wrap things up? I'd just reiterate that Lesbians Who Tech uh, group is phenomenal, and WESIS as well. I've, I'm in and there weekly. It's fantastic. Terrific. Thank you. And, you know, there are, we've mentioned just a few, but there are special interest groups within ISSA, within ISACA, and of course, another of my favorites is ISC Squared. And I know that uh, ISC Squared has a panel coming up on cybersecurity careers later this evening. I believe it's at 6 p.m. Eastern time, if I am not mistaken. So I encourage everyone to, to check that out. Um, I would like to take this opportunity now to thank my panelists, Christine, Farah, Karen, Lindsay, thank you for joining me today. And we will be sure to put some of those resources that we talked about in the uh, chat on cyberexchange.ca. So if you didn't manage to get them down, don't worry, you can go, go check out the, the feed on CyberExchange. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Thank you.